Well, turn to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. A passage that many people uh, don't hear taught very often. And when they do, it's simply that the import of it is diminished. It's taught as if the mystery here being Gentiles taking part in what we read in the rest of the scriptures. So it's not really very climactic in that uh, the Bible had been written up to Ephesians, this whole part of the Bible. And uh, just now we're learning that, oh, Gentiles can take part of that too. And that's typically how it's taught. Is that all those things are given to Israel? You can have them too. That's generally the teaching. And in fact, we'll hear tonight some commentators make those statements. Is that all this is saying is that Gentiles can have what Israel had. Right? Um, that really lowers the importance, uh, the significance of this mystery information about who you are in Christ. Okay? And this is going to be the problem with people failing to see what is the fellowship of the mystery of Christ. So tonight we're going to hit it on the head, hit it in the target of what is the mystery of Christ as Paul describes in Ephesians 3, these important passages here. Let's just read through the first three verses here. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, uh, that he's a prisoner, of course, tells us that uh, uh, when this book was written at a certain time. Paul was in prison multiple times, uh, but there's not many verses in the book of Ephesians that can help us date when it is. But this word here, him being a prisoner, could put it perhaps during the time in which he was imprisoned in Acts 24, Acts 28. And so he's a prisoner for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And that's where we stopped last week. The necessity for us to read what Paul wrote to understand the mystery, the dispensation of the grace of God. Pick it up in verse 5 tonight, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. So those are the verses we'll hope to cover tonight, starting in verse 5. We've seen Paul clearly say that a dispensation of the grace of God is given him to them, to the Ephesians, to us. Okay, so the goal wasn't just that Paul was special and he's boasting about his uniqueness, but it is something that he's been given the task of dispensing it from God to everyone else. We'll see that again in verse 9 where he says he's to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. We'll cover that next week. And so he calls this dispensation of grace a mystery that's been revealed. A lot of commentators will go into this verse talking about how the mystery, there were mysteries in Gnostic religions and pagan religions and things like this. Or Christians will sometimes appeal to that and say, well, God works in mysterious ways, right? I'm not available. Yeah, so, okay. And so uh, that, that's not what he's saying here, of course, because the mystery here has been revealed. It's the revelation of it. And so that's something good to realize. Uh, reading about it is important because it's not something we sit back and pray and hope that God's going to give us this mystic vision and, and revelation during the, the worship service. This is something Paul has written down for us to read and understand. Verse 5, it tells us there's three things in the, verse 5 and verse 6 and verse 7 that we're going to cover tonight. Uh, the first is in verse 5 where this mystery was not made known before. That would seem to be self-explanatory, but this is the problem you get when people fail to see the fellowship of the mystery is they uh, consistently think that what Paul is saying is not that different than what was known before. And yet he says right here, it, this was not known. And so we need, we need to emphasize that a bit and see what, what Paul meant by that. In verse 6, he's going to describe what that mystery is among the Gentiles in three points. And then in verse 7, he's going to end with the fact that he is the minister of it, which apparently is a significant thing. Again, this is something people downplay, Paul's special apostleship or his unique ministry regarding this message, as if so did everyone else. You know, as if Paul's just simply saying here, as someone who's zealous and on fire, who wants to join the ministry of the church, that, you know, oh, well, I'm a minister, I'm a minister of God, and he's simply proclaiming and boasting in that. Uh, and yet, why, why would he say the things that he says regarding his ministry and his task and the gift given to him especially? Okay, so um, we'll, we'll get to that at the end of the, today's lesson as well. So let's begin in verse 5. This mystery, it says, in other ages was not made known. Now in Colossians 1.26, it adds the word generations. And so we need to stop here for a moment and realize what that word ages mean. 
And we've covered this before, that that word age has to do with how many years or period of time something has been. So ages has to do with a period of time. Now, in Schofield's reference Bible, in his notes some hundred years ago, uh, he wrote that a dispensation was a period of time, and he went on and, and, and completed the definition. And he's gotten a lot of flack for that, and rightly so, because it's not a period of time. And even today, people kind of fall into this thinking that they're trying to find out when the dispensation of the grace of God began down to the month and the day and the hour. And at that time, suddenly the, light, the sun changed color, and the lights changed color, and, and everything's different. Um, well, it didn't work that way, okay? There was a time that Christ revealed the revelation of the mystery, but it was to Paul, it was to this small group of people. Okay, the world kept going on as it was. Peter and his group kept going on as they were. And there wasn't just this clean break, okay? Um, it's not a period of time. Uh, neither is it the same thing in, in past dispensations, where it's described as a period of time. And the, the reason why is in verse 3, it tells us what that dispensation is. Verse 2 says, The dispensation of the grace of God, how that by revelation he made known unto me. See, a dispensation concerns a revelation being made known. Okay, so it's not, it's not, not exactly a time. But verse 5, Paul is talking about time. He says, in other ages, it was not made known. Ages being periods of time. Colossians 1.26, he says, in other generations, it's not made known. Now, generations, that word has to do with your family tree and generations and groups of people. Right? So, in other times and in other, no other people have known this, is what Paul's saying. And that's significant. So, at no other time has this been made known, which is why he says in, in verse 5, but now, as it is now. Okay, in Ephesians 2, he said, but now. And in Romans, we covered all that, but, those but now verses. In Colossians 1, it's the same thing, where he says, in other gener ages and generations, this was secret. Okay? And so, in verse 5 here, what, what you get from some folks who will question uh, the uniqueness of this revelation is that they see that phrase, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets, and they say, well, if it says as it is now, does that mean it was kind of known before and it's just known better now? Because don't you use that phrase? You know, um, it's, it's, it's not as bright as it is now outside, right? Or it's not as, you know, uh, the air's not as clean as it is now. And so this is a relative type of comparison. They say, well, it was bright before, it was clean before, but now it's more clean, more bright. And so here the revelation, as it is now revealed. So it was revealed before, but it was hidden in shadows and types and, and all sorts of prophecies in the Old Testament. And then now the veil is taken back and we can understand the prophecies and the shadows and the types and see all those things clearly, right? And so this is how people want to explain it. Of course, that is the teaching of the book of Hebrews. Right? That's what Hebrews does. Hebrews shows all the shadows and types of the Old Testament, how they point to Christ, and how the temple and tabernacle points to Christ, and all those prophecies are fulfilled in Christ. So there's an element of truth of that. There's an element of truth that in the Old Testament, there's a lot of hidden information in the prophecies. And we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Hebrews and Revelation specifically, that book of Revelation, it's called the Revelation of Jesus Christ, where it reveals things that the prophets didn't quite understand about the latter days and about how God would bring his kingdom in. And so there is an element of truth in the scripture where things were hidden in prophecies, and then in the New Testament, in Matthew, Luke, and John, and Hebrews, and Revelation, these things are made known. In fact, Paul himself says in Colossians 2, doesn't he say that those things, the, the Sabbath days and all those uh, sacrifices and, the, and the, the meats and the drinks, were shadows of things to come, Right? And so the things to come, being in the book of Revelation and Hebrews, he says, but the body is of Christ. And most people read that verse and they, they say, oh, the things to come is the body of Christ. So they're a shadow of the body of Christ. Or you could read it this way, that there's three things in the verse. There's the things that were a shadow of things to come in the future, but the body now is of Christ. There's three things, you say. But that's not, not often taken. So... We're covering in Ephesians 3, 5, this phrase, as it is now, and whether this speaks to the fact that the mystery that Paul's talking about was indeed hidden in prophecy, in the prophets. Can we go back in the prophets and find what Paul said when he says, in other ages it was not made known? Maybe they were writing things down in the prophets that they didn't know what they meant. 
Doesn't Peter say that in 1 Peter 1? Peter says the prophets didn't understand all of what they wrote. And so this is how most people interpret this. I'm bringing this up because you read through this, uh, perhaps from our lens of thinking, and you say it's so clear, how can anyone you know, not see this? And I'm trying to show you what other people see. Okay, just so that you, to challenge you a bit in what the verses are saying. Now, I don't think there's any merit to this idea that the mystery was actually in prophecy. Okay, for the very fact that if you look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul tells us where it was hid. Ephesians 3, verse 9, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The mystery means a secret, right? And he says in verse 5, it, in other ages it was not made known as it is now revealed. And in verse 9, he, make, he wants to make all men see this fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. It does not say in the scriptures. It does not say in the prophets, but in God. Okay? And we'll see here in a moment why that was significant. Look at 2 Timothy 2, 1, verse 9. 2 Timothy 1, 9. So where was it hid? People say, well, as it is now revealed, it must have been hid, but it was hidden in the Scriptures. So we can read about it back there in Proverbs and Psalms. Now that we know what it is, we can find it back in Psalms and find it back in Isaiah and Jeremiah. That's what they want to do. Okay? In fact, one commentator uh, 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 said just that. I think it was Henry Morris in his commentary on the Bible. He said, uh, what this mystery is in Ephesians 3 is it allows Gentiles to go back to the Old Testament promises and apply them to us. It just straight out said it, right? And that's how they read it, okay? But this is contradictory to the scripture here. You have to twist the, the verses that Paul writes. 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. <clears throat> Paul says, God hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, that's grace, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus when? Before the world began. It doesn't, now we already read Ephesians 3, 9 that the mystery was hid in God, in Christ, right? But here it tells us when it was hid. It was hid before the world began. So it's not something where when God revealed the prophecies in the Old Testament, in those prophecies he hid the mystery because that wasn't before the world began. And that's not God, Right? So see, it's very simple what the scriptures say. The mystery was hid in God before the world began. But we don't have any Old Testament scriptures talking about before the world began. It starts out in Genesis, in the beginning of the world. He created the heaven and the earth, and it goes on from there. And then we see God revealing things to the prophets and to Israel and their fathers. We don't read anything about something before the world began until Paul. Okay, <clears throat> so that's how easy it is. Look at Romans 16, 25. <clears throat> If it was something that was in prophecy somehow, where now that we have further revelation of it, further enlightenment of it, we can go back and find it back there, it would be a contradiction to Romans 16, 25. Now to him there's a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Kept secret. How can it be kept secret if it was written in the prophets? Deuteronomy 29 says this. It says the secret things belong to God, but the things that he's revealed, you know, are for us to understand. That's what Deuteronomy 29 says. Okay, so he's talking about, back there about the law. And, and David's talking about meditating on the law, learning things from the law, and finding treasures in the law. And you're supposed to explore the scriptures that God reveals because he wants you to have them. And so back in prophecy, God revealed them, and no man understood everything in, in, in the scriptures. You know, they're too deep for that. People were digging and exploring because God laid it on the table. But there were many things God did not reveal. And it said the secret things belong to God. Okay? Well, this was one of those secret things. The mystery, which was kept secret. You don't keep a secret a secret by telling your neighbor. Right? I mean, you don't do that. So why would God tell the prophets, write it down in a book, preserve them, memorize it, keep it in your mind, and then tell us later, oh, I put something in there that you didn't know. Was he deliberately tricking them by telling them to study it and then later telling them, you didn't find that out, did you? you see, the mystery was kept secret. It was not even revealed. Okay. So, yeah, but, but, is now made, but now is made manifest by the scripture of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God. Notice the first two words. Okay. But now. 
In Ephesians 3, 5, people want to talk about the as it is now as if it's a relative term, but they, they forget what, it, what he's saying. Step back from the tree and read the forest there. He says, as it is now revealed. It is now revealed. If it's revealed, that means it was not seen before. It was not known before. Okay. In Romans 16, 25, it's now made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets. These prophets here, it's not talking about the Old Testament prophets. Okay. In fact, many commentators recognize that. But uh, they're not the authority. Uh, it's now made manifest, as Paul has been making it manifest in the book of Romans here, according to the commandment of everlasting God. When did God command that this thing be known? That's the question. It wasn't when God wrote Genesis. It wasn't when God wrote Exodus. It wasn't when God wrote the prophets. It was when God revealed it as it is now. Uh, Paul says there's, there's ages did not know it, generations did not know it, until this. Okay. And so... Romans 16, 26, know what he says. It's made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Made known to all nations. Okay. That, that's never been the case where God has been telling people to obey this mystery information uh, until Paul. So uh, the, the word revelation, again, means it's been unveiled. Okay. Um, Galatians 1, verse 12. Look at Galatians 1, 12. Let's just cover these. <coughs> Galatians 1, verse 12. Verse 11 says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. If it were hidden in the Old Testament prophets, and Paul is simply taking the Old Testament prophets and teaching you the mystery from them, then he's hearing it from a man. I mean, God inspired the man, but he's learning it from them, you see. God gave him the key to see it a little better. But if you can teach the mystery from the prophets, it's in the prophets, isn't it? I mean, you, 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 if, if you take a prophetic verse and say, we'll take that for today, and this teaches you your position in the body of Christ and your position in heavenly places, and that there's one body, not Jews and Gentiles, if you can take an Old Testament verse and teach that from it, then that means it's been revealed already. People just missed it, right? And, and yet you can't do that. Inevitably what people want to say is that, well, you've got to read it between the lines of the Old Testament. Go back to the Old Testament, read between the lines. Well, the, <laughs> there's blank space between the lines. There's nothing there between the lines. You're putting things back in between those lines, which was not there. So you say, we who are Pauline do not take the Bible and throw it in the trash can and only study Paul as the Bible. That's, that's not what we do. All scripture is profitable. But either it's there or it's not there. If you're reading between the lines, it's not there. You see. Of course, we go back in the Old Testament and we see, knowing God's purpose now, we see why God could offer David grace. We know why God was so long-suffering. We know how God could save sinners from the beginning of the world because we know God's manifold wisdom through the cross of Christ. But that was never explained. That was never known. And that was never part of God's purpose on the earth to make that known. Okay? And so, anyway, Galatians 1.12 says, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. It required Christ to reveal it for it to be preached and known. Okay? And so there was a revelation there that was necessary. So when was this, this uh, mystery hid? It was hid from ages, all ages, and all generations. Right? Until now. And where was it hid? It was hid in God during those ages and generations. Until now. All right, look at 1 Corinthians 2. There's a reason why that is. I'm just not trying to make a point of, well, okay, it was hidden. There's a purpose to that. It's not just a matter of whether you believe me that it was kept secret or not, or believe the scripture, but if it was known, then it disrupts the purpose of God. You see, there's a, there's a purpose for it being hidden. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7, Paul says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained when? Before the world, unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The cross of Christ, which is the gospel by which we preach, which is the event, which is the merit of everyone's salvation who is saved throughout history, past, present, future, it necessitated that he die. And if he had revealed the purpose of that cross, it revealed the mystery, it says they would not have crucified him. The devils of this world would not have allowed it to happen. I mean, why would you go down that, that road? If this was the key to God's salvation of the universe, not only on the earth, but in heavenly places, in your own downfall, why would you just say, yeah, go ahead, let's kill him? You'd do everything you can to prevent 
hidden, dying, right? Again, going back to, to Peter when he, he tried to prevent Christ's death on the cross and Jesus called him the devil, you know. But 1 Corinthians 2, 7 tells us the purpose for why it needed to be hidden and secret, okay? Um, in Titus 1, verse 2, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised. When did he promise it? To Abraham? To Moses? We'll see later. He gave promises to Abraham. He gave promises to Moses. He gave promises to David. But the one that Paul's talking about is the promise God made before the world began. Well, who knew about that? Nobody. Right? The only promises God had made since the world began was to Abraham and to Israel and to Moses and these guys. Right? Paul says, well, there's a promise God made before the world began. It precedes all of that. Okay? Verse 3, But hath in due time manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of God our Savior. That's the commandment in Romans 16, 26. Okay? God commanded him to do it. He, I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm a prisoner. He's making me do it. A dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. 1 Corinthians 9, 17. Okay. To, it's a dispensation of the grace of God given me to you. It's a command to make all men see it. Okay. There's a commission there, a, a mission and a purpose that has been given to Paul. Look at Luke 1, 68. You've got to contrast this. And these are verses that you, you need to be familiar with. I know they're, they're basic. We've covered them before. Uh, at Grace Ambassadors here, but many people don't connect these dots. But you've got to see Luke 1, 60, 68 here, where Zechariah, this is uh, right before Luke 2 and the Nativity, right? And Luke 1, 68, Zechariah prophesies, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Now, consider this. When you ask many people what they think the mystery is in Ephesians 3 or that Paul writes about, many people will tell you the mystery is Jesus Christ. That, that it is Jesus Christ. Not the body of Christ or the things that we make it, but the person of Jesus Christ. That God would be made flesh. I mean, the prophets didn't know that God himself would inhabit a human being, a flesh, and it would come and, and walk on the earth. And it would be a baby in a manger, and that incarnation is the mystery. And of course, the Bible speaks about this type of thing, where the prophets didn't know exactly all the details of what would happen, right? But about that, about Zacharias talking about a Redeemer, a Savior coming in the person of Jesus Christ, he says, this was spoken by the mouth of the prophets since the world began. So here's where you put the explanation that there was things in the prophets they didn't quite understand, but they were there. And then when the incarnation happens, they read them and say, yep, that's there. Luke 1, 69 and 70 says it was spoken by the prophets. They didn't know it, but it was spoken. We often like to point to people to the book of Luke, Luke 18 or Mark 9, where Jesus tells his disciples that I need to die on the cross. Remember these, these times? Or Matthew 16. And his disciples ignorantly respond, you know, you don't need to die. Or they didn't know. Luke 18, 34 says they did not understand the things about his death. And then in Luke 24, Jesus tells his disciples, the law and the prophets spoke of my death. The death of Jesus Christ is part of prophecy. Jesus had to do it because prophecy said it had to be done. Right? So that was part of things the prophets spoke since the world began. But the mere death of Jesus Christ is not the mystery of Jesus Christ. Right? The mystery of Christ is how he died on purpose to save the whole world from their sins. So it was the glory of God being on display on the cross, not the shame of humanity, right? And also how that death on the cross establishes a new creature called the body of Christ. That wasn't known anywhere. Find that anywhere in the Old Testament prophets. But Luke 170 is a good verse to have because I'm showing you here how in the incarnation of Jesus, which many people think is the mystery, this guy says, Zechariah says, That's, that was prophesied. That was known. So Paul can't be talking about Jesus, God manifest in the flesh, being the mystery of Christ, because Paul says it wasn't known by the prophets. Zechariah says that was. You see? So it's something beyond just the person of Jesus. It concerns the work of Jesus. Acts chapter 2, 29.
So when you make the mystery of Christ that Paul speaks about, the incarnation of Jesus and God manifest in the flesh, which are both truths that we hold dear and fundamental as Christians, uh, when you make it that, you have removed the knowledge of the hope of your calling, the riches of God's glorious grace given to you. You've removed all that, which is the real content of the mystery from your understanding, which explains, if you're a doctrinal doctor, to diagnose the illness of the church, it explains why Christians have the problems they do. They're not assured of their salvation. They don't know how to walk. They don't know whether or not their sin takes away their fellowship with God. They, they, they have no hope, it seems like. Their only hope is in these promises they find in the Old Testament, which only happen 50% of the time by circumstance in their life. It's, they're, they're, they're lacking all the things the mystery provides because they don't know what it is. They know who Jesus is, but they don't know the mystery of Christ. Acts 2.28. <clears throat> Verse 29, rather. Men and brethren, Peter stands up in Acts 2 and says, Let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried in his sepulchres with us this day, therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing us before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. What do we learn from this passage? What is Peter telling us here? That David, in Psalms, the prophets, in the Psalms, and the law, spoke of what? The resurrection of Jesus. But why did Jesus resurrect according to prophecy? In verse 30, see the last phrase? He would raise up Christ to sit on David's throne. Why was Christ resurrected according to prophecy? To sit on David's throne. Why was Christ resurrected according to the mystery? To be the head of the body of Christ and to give you the power of resurrection. That's according to the mystery. That's why Paul says in 2 Timothy 2 that Paul, or uh, that Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my, Paul's gospel. Because that's the message we're preaching about the resurrection. We're not preaching Christ's death and resurrection as the gospel saying, well, believe that he died because the prophet said he had to, and believe he rose from the dead because he sits on David's throne. If that's all you know about the death and resurrection, you're missing out on the glorious power of the cross. Okay, <clears throat> that's why Paul says, and he's the only one that says, I preach the cross and I glory in the cross. <clears throat> it's not just a, <clears throat> a fact of history, it's been fulfilled, according to prophecy, which it's also that. But it's more than that, okay? So these are things that are not hidden. <clears throat> the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, according to prophecy, was not a secret. Okay, these guys may not have known it, they not have read or studied it, and this way it was hidden from them. Luke 18, 34 says that. But it was there, always there, for them to know. Paul, however, says there are things not known. <clears throat> there were things they could not know, have known. Look at Acts 3, 21. <clears throat> Acts 3, 21. <clears throat> Peter, again, is talking about prophecy when he says, that the heaven must receive Christ until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Christ's return to restore all things was prophesied. Everything Peter preaches in Acts 2 and 3 was something prophecy spoke about. Now, Peter himself didn't understand those things when he was working with Jesus in his earthly ministry. He didn't understand all of them. But that's why Jesus explained them. And that's why Luke 24 says Jesus opened their eyes to the scriptures. He opened the scriptures to their understanding. Paul says it wasn't revealed in other ages and generations. It was not made known. And if Christ hadn't revealed it to him, no one would know it. That's what Paul says. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see another place. Look at 1 Peter 1, verse 9. 1 Peter 1, 9. Then we need to move on. <clears throat> Many people make the reference from Ephesians 3, 5 to 1 Peter 1, verse 10. As again, we're talking about things that were not known as they are now known. In 1 Peter 1, verse 10, it says, of which, Peter writes about salvation. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Now, where are the prophets searching? In the inspired scriptures given to Israel, right? This, so the prophets inquired and searched diligently who prophesied. This is all prophecy. Prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So is this grace a mystery? It's prophecy. 
There's grace that was prophesied in the Old Testament. Salvation to Israel prophesied in the Scriptures. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now tell me, what is the glory that should follow the suffering of Christ in that verse? What do the prophets talk about the glory that follows the suffering of Christ? The kingdom. It's the glory of the kingdom. Read First and Second Peter and he talks about the kingdom. He's talking about the hope of the kingdom and the glory of the kingdom. Acts 3.21, what did he say? Christ will return to restore all things, as the prophet said. The glory that Peter's hoping for is Christ return and bring his glory. So I don't know. You just seem to kind of just make that up. Well, read the epistles for yourself. And also read 1 Peter 1.9, which I deliberately did not read, so I can come back and make this ha-ha moment for you. Paul, or Peter says, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. When does your salvation occur? Look at verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The end of your faith, the salvation of their souls, is going to be brought to them when Christ returns. Well, there goes the book of Ephesians which is talking all about you being saved now and having the, being in Christ now and seated in heavenly places now. And he's saying when Christ returns, that's when the glory returns. That's when glory happens. Until then, we're suffering. Right? That's what he's saying. Prophecy spoke about the death of Christ and the glory in the kingdom that would follow that. It did not speak at all about the mystery. Okay? <clears throat> what the prophets wrote is nothing that the mystery describes. People who think that it is simply don't know what the mystery is, and that's what we're going to study in this next section here. What you find is that when Paul says, as is now revealed, that what he's teaching the mystery is, which many people don't know what it is exactly, was revealed after the cross. He says, as it is now, that now means it can't be back with Abraham. He doesn't say it's now revealed, meaning to Abraham 4,000 years ago, or, or it's now revealed as, you know, to Jeremiah, you know, 3,000 years ago. It's not even as it is now revealed in Jesus' earthly ministry, because they didn't know it there. It was after the cross. It was after Acts 2, after Acts 3. Actually, find it in there. Find the word cross anywhere in the New Testament. Okay? And the only time that the cross is preached as good news is in Paul's epistles. You don't even find the word cross in the book of James, the book of Peter. Peter doesn't even mention the word cross. It mentions Christ's blood and all that. That's a different story. But you also see that this information, as we'll see, is, is revealed before Acts 28. Okay, this mystery information was known. We already read 1 Corinthians 2 and Romans 16. It was known before Acts 28. Let's look at Ephesians 3, 6. Let's move on here. It not being known before is going to be a point of contention you find with people when you try to make them see the fellowship of the mystery. That's why we spend some time on it. Okay? You didn't know how to handle and how to explain and how to show people that there was things before the world began and there were things since the world began and they're different. Ephesians 3, 6, what is this mystery? Now, this mystery that when you read, you can know Paul's knowledge is explained in verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now, many people, when they first study the mystery, they come to this verse, say, that's it right there. And it, indeed it is, but it's in summary form. Remember in verse 1, Paul says, for this cause. What cause? The cause they wrote about in chapter 1 and chapter 2. He says in verse 3 and 4, I wrote a four in few words. Well, where are you going to read that? Chapter 1, chapter 2. You can read it in Romans. There's the mystery in Romans. 5, 6, 7, 8. There's the mystery in 1 Corinthians, chapter 2. Okay? Uh, chapter 15 deals with some of it. There, there's a mystery in Ephesians 1 and 2. In Ephesians 1 and 2, we, we studied in detail the mystery and what it was. So this verse 6 is simply a summary of what it is. Because his point in chapter 3 is not to explain the mystery, it's to show that we have a ministry to make it known. He says, no one knew it before. He gave it to me to give it to you. I've got to make it known to you. I gotta, we've got to make it known. We've got to make all men see what this is. He's already explained what it was. Here he's just summarizing it. But it is a nice summary. And there's three things listed here. Of course, the first thing in the verse says that the Gentiles, and that word just kind of sticks out like a sore thumb because God had never given Gentiles, <laughs> he, he, he had given Israel everything. Romans 9, Paul says that. Romans 3, Paul says that. And so that's what makes this unique, of, above all things, that is including Gentiles, apparently. That the Gentiles should have these things. Look at Acts 22. Keep your hand here and turn back to Acts 22 real quick. We can't forget the impact that this is. And, and again, 
many people read this and Christians just kind of overlook it because, I mean, yeah, we're Gentiles today and the church has been in Gentile nations for quite a while. And so they kind of see this mystery as just kind of an extension of the program. Like, uh, you know, God was working through Israel and then he said, I will open it up to everybody. Kind of like, you know, when they first released the iPhone, it's only to certain, you know, inside members. And then eventually everyone can buy the thing. And that's all that it is. Just kind of opening it up to everyone. Right. So, yeah, OK. It, it was an important deal. But, you know, we all have access now. So what's the point? But that's not what all that it was. I mean, yeah, that was a revolutionary shift. But it's not just opening up the same thing that Israel had. It's a totally different thing. You know, so instead of iPhone 10 or whatever the thing was that recently was invented, it's like iPhone 20 coming out. You know, we had iPhone 10, now it's iPhone, you know, 20, 35, you know. What? What's this thing? No one knew about this before. Exactly. That's what the mystery is. It's a totally different thing happening. It's a new creature. Acts 21, 20, and 22. Here Paul is in Jerusalem talking about his conversion. And people are, are fighting against Paul because of what he's teaching about to Gentiles about the blessings and riches they can have by grace freely. He's not teaching them the law and that sort of thing. He's not telling them to be circumcised. And so they've heard about this. So he's trying to tell them that, look, I got this information from the Lord of glory. Acts 22, 21. He says, uh, <clears throat> I'm in the wrong chapter, 22, 21. He's talking about how Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And Jesus said unto him, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And verse 22, it says, they gave him audience. They were listening to Paul's testimony and his history and how he was on the road and Jesus appeared to him. He, they didn't get upset when he said, the Lord appeared to me. They didn't get upset when he said, and he started speaking to me. They didn't get upset when he said, he told me to do something. They got upset when he said, depart and go to the Gentiles. Now that word, it says in verse 22, they lift up their voice and said, away with such a fellow from the earth. It's not fit that he should live. It wasn't because of his vision. It wasn't because he said he saw the Lord. It's because he said Gentiles. Because the God of Israel would not send you to Gentiles with things that were given to us, right? Especially with things that look better than what he gave to us, right? So it's the Gentiles is a significant part of this mystery. And so, you know, there's a grace pastor named Keith Blades who used to always call it the dispensation of Gentile grace. And uh, he did that, try to emphasize the Gentileness of the dispensation. Of course, we know in the body of Christ, there's no Jew or Gentile. So it's not just to Gentiles. Uh, Christ sent Paul as his chosen vessel to the Gentiles and to Israel and the kings. Okay, but Ephesians 3, verse 6, the Gentiles is important. But there are three things listed here that the Gentiles have. And number one is that they should be fellow heirs. The Gentiles should be fellow heirs, comma. The second thing, they're of the same body, comma. And the third thing, they're partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Okay, so there's three things here. We'll just cover them in order. By the way, each of these things has to do with Christ. All right? They have to do with Christ. I say that, and I have here a, a Bible uh, with four different translations in it. <clears throat> I'm going to turn to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, and read to you from the New International Version. Okay? <clears throat> Ephesians 3, verse 6 in the NIV. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. Is there anything in verse 6 that mentions Israel? No. The NIV puts it in the Bible. There is no Greek text that says together with Israel. Anywhere. Okay? It's not, it doesn't exist. And I don't want to open the can of translation textual criticism, but that's just something they put in the Bible. So if you've got an NIV Bible, you're, you're disadvantaged from the start, aren't you? Reading Ephesians 3, verse 6. You're immediately thinking, oh, we're, we're with Israel, I guess. Right? We're, uh, Israel had promises, and now we are with Israel's promises. So, okay. So you're already blocked out. Even people who use Bibles that don't have together with Israel, like the right Bible you have in front of you, okay, will say in their explanation of the verse that they're fellow heirs with Israel. Right? Why do they say that? Because they're, they're thinking, well, God was working through Israel, and now he's opening up to Gentiles, and they get the same thing Israel had. What did we learn in Ephesians 2? That's why I keep hearkening back to chapter 2. This isn't the first time you learn about the mystery. It's just a summary of it. Chapter 2 explains that in time past, you were called uncircumcision by the circumcision. In time past, you were strangers from the covenants. And it goes on to explain, but now... You are far off or made nigh by the blood of Christ, and out of two he made one new. And if there were two, Jew and Gentile, and then there's one new, can the new thing be Israel? 
No. Can the new thing be Gentile? No. It's totally new. That's what Ephesians 2.15 says. You've got to know that coming into Ephesians 3. Or else you're going to, like many people, insert Israel in there and think that's the end of it. Right? You're not a fellow with Israel, folks. That, that, that doesn't get you where you need to be. Okay? Israel was close to God by virtue of their covenants and virtue of the promises they had with God. Okay? But, though they were close, they were not as close as God has made you in Christ. They were close in that they had a building that God dwelt in in their neighborhood. Okay? They were close to God because they had a covenant from God where God would sometime in the future give them something by promise. Here's how you're close to God. It's because of the cross of Christ, you are actually in the, the body of Christ. That's how close you are. We covered that at the end of chapter 2. Right? Israel had a household of God. You're in the household of God because you're in the body. And where the body of Christ is, is in the house of God. You see? And so, you being in, members of his uh, body, flesh with flesh, bone with bones, is a lot closer than, than they could ever be. You being a fellow heir, if you're just an heir with Israel, then all you can have is Israel's things. That means you can't have any of the spiritual blessings in heavenly places that were never promised to Israel. There are things that were never promised to Israel that you have. And so, if you put yourself in Israel's position, you're taking away the things that God has promised you freely by grace. Not all of them. But a lot of them. People will say, well, there's things that God promised Israel, like forgiveness. And I have forgiveness. Yeah, that's true. He promised them salvation. I have salvation. Yep, that's true. But did he promise them all spiritual blessings in heavenly places? Nope. Did he promise them a complete position in Christ when they believe? Nope. See, there are things you have that if you make yourself Israel, they get removed. And that's the danger of not seeing the fellowship of the mystery. Anyway, the verse says the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Fellow heirs with who? Who's the other fellow? It's Jesus Christ, folks. Okay? It's Jesus Christ. I put your outline in the parenthesis, my parenthesis, not Bible. Fellow heirs with Christ. Look at Romans 8, 17, which we covered before. Here's my cross-reference. People don't have a cross-reference to make it fellow heirs with Israel. They'll go back to Ephesians 2 and make a mess. But Romans 8, verse 17 says... If you're children, then you're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. I have a cross reference to say what I said. What's a joint heir? The same as a fellow heir. That's, that's all it is. You're, you're a joint heir with Christ because you're in Christ. So what he gets, you get. You're a fellow heir with him. And that's amazing. That's not just being promised the Christ. That's you being in Christ. The body of Christ. <clears throat> Look at Ephesians 1, verse 14. Fellow heir, that word heir, is where you get the word inheritance, right? Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1 talked about our inheritance, where it says that we have the Holy Spirit of promise when we believe the gospel that we hear, the gospel of salvation. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. The Holy Spirit is that first part, that down payment of the inheritance God's promised to you, the Holy Spirit. Okay? Your fellow heirs with Christ. All right? You get that freely. Ephesians 1 in verse 18. Paul prays. Remember chapter 1, he prays for those three things. Those three things Paul prays that you know are the same three things in Ephesians 3 verse 6. The same things. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The inheritance. That you might know the riches of the glory of the inheritance. Because if you make your inheritance the same inheritance that Israel gets, then you're not understanding the riches of the glory of the inheritance. As he'll say next week, we'll cover the unsearchable riches of Christ, which cannot be searched out in the scriptures before they were revealed to Paul. Right. And so that, that's why he's talking about being fellow heirs with Christ. You have access to things that no one's had before. By grace, through him. Look at Romans 4.13. How do you become a fellow heir? With Christ? It's by grace, not the law. This is the mystery part here. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Well, how in the world can a Gentile be a fellow heir? That's the question a Jew might ask, right? Or someone who studied the scripture might ask. Well, Romans 4 explains that. Romans 4 talks about some mystery information. You thought it was only in Ephesians. Romans 4 in verse 13 says, The promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. 
For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. So if you're a fellow heir, okay, it's got to be by grace, through faith, not through the law. So what benefit is there of you saying, my fellow heir with Israel? Well, Israel is given God's law. You don't get it through the law. Romans 4 says, if it was through the law, then faith's made void. You get it through faith. You see, that's what Romans 4 is all about, the imputation by faith. Okay, and so faith, was, faith is the, the thing there, not Israel, not a law. Look at Galatians 3.18. Galatians 3. Keep your hand in Galatians 2. We'll come back here probably. Galatians 3, verse 18. Paul writes about some of the same things in a lot of his epistles. And that's good, because that means the Bible is its own commentary on itself. You can read different passages and explains each other. Okay? Galatians 3.18. People say, well, they say it differently, so it must be a totally different thing. It's not always like that. Sometimes you say things differently to try to explain the same thing. Right? And so there's take some comprehension there. And, and, and that's hard for a lot of people to do, but Galatians 3.18 says, If the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Right, so he uses Abraham as an illustration, as an example, to say, remember Abraham back there? He, he was before the law even was given, but he received his inheritance by promise, and it's that same way that we receive an inheritance, Gentiles receive an inheritance, not through the law. Because the idea in the Galatians was that they were being told that you can't receive an inheritance in the kingdom unless you follow this law. As a Christian, you've got to now follow the law, because every good Christian is going to follow the law. Well, you don't get your inheritance through the law, so what's the point? You get it through the promise. And the promise that you've been given is the promise of eternal life from before the world began. It's by grace. And so, it's different. Look at Galatians 4, verse 7. Thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then you're an heir of God through Christ. The mysteries that Gentiles should be fellow heirs, with Christ, not with Israel. By grace, not by the law. The second point in Ephesians 3, 6 is that the Gentiles should be of the same body. And people will think, see that in their mind's eye, oh, the same body, uh, along with Israel. Right? So there's Israel, that body of people God was working with, and now the Gentiles are the same body that God was working with. Israel, right? And so they're the true Israel of God. We're spiritual Israel. But you don't, that's not the language Paul uses. In fact, you can't find that phrase, spiritual Israel, anywhere in the scripture. Okay? The only body Paul's been talking about in Ephesians is the body of Christ. And so you're the same body, it's the body of Christ. And so in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, remember we covered that, that he made Christ the head of the body, which is the church, the body of Christ. Okay? In Ephesians 2, 15 and 16, he made of two, one new man, in Ephesians 2, and in Ephesians 2.16, remember what it said right after that, that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body. And so it wasn't just the Gentiles that needed to be reconciled to God, it was the Jews too. You can't make Gentiles the same body with Israel, it doesn't help them, because Israel's fallen. And so he took both Jew and Gentile, put them in one new body, the body of Christ. It's a totally different thing. And notice in verse 16, how he did that that he might reconcile both into God in one body by the cross. That's how he does it. So we need to be part of Israel's new covenant. How? Because that gets us close to God. It doesn't. The covenant doesn't get you close to God. The cross gets you close to God. There's a difference. Okay? Because you don't read about the cross when you read Jeremiah 31. It's only when you read between the lines. Right? And what do we say before about between the lines? There's nothing between the lines. It's blank. <laughs> You're reading things into there. And so, in, in Ephesians, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 27, of course, it says, by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. It's the body of Christ Paul's talking about. You don't find the phrase body of Christ anywhere in the Bible outside of Paul's epistles. You, you just don't. Okay? So, by the context, it should be very clear what, what's happening here. People will say, well, if in 1 Corinthians 12, 23, you are of the same body, which is a new creature, and it's not Israel, it's a new creature, and you're, it's by one spirit, you're baptized in the body. One of the biggest objections to Pauline right division, Pauline dispensationalism, is, is that, well, the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost. And so it's by one spirit, you're baptized into the body of Christ. That Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost. Weren't they also baptized into the body of Christ? Anybody thought this? You should have. Uh, this is uh, something to think about. It's a popular objection, okay, uh, popular in, in, the, in, the, in books, 
not just on the internet, but actually in books that people wrote and think about it. But is it true that wherever the Spirit is, there's the body of Christ? That's the thing to consider. Okay. Paul says, by one Spirit, we're baptized into the body. But it doesn't mean that everywhere there's the Spirit, there's the body. Else, David would have been in the body. He had the Holy Spirit. He prayed that God would not remove the Holy Ghost from him. Right? The Spirit was on Samson. How did he knock down those walls, by the way? Power of the Spirit. Right? Saul, King Saul was anointed with the Spirit. Solomon was anointed with the Spirit at one point. Right? The Holy Spirit was on lots of people in the Old Testament. Not everyone, but there certain people, anointed ones. Were they in the body of Christ? Did they get removed from the body of Christ when the Spirit left them, as it did Saul? Right? How did that work? What about, uh, you know, you say, well, the body of Christ includes Gentiles. Well, there's Gentiles in the Old Testament, too. Rahab is part of Jesus' lineage. He's a Gentile. Is she the body of Christ? You see, it goes deeper than just, are you a Gentile? It goes deeper than just, do you have the Spirit? God's Spirit was floating on the waters of Genesis 1, too. The question is, what is God's Spirit doing? The Spirit is God, remember. What is the Spirit doing? The Spirit has a conscience, you understand. It, it has a will. The Spirit is God. And so, just as God did one thing with Noah, and did another thing with Moses, and did another thing you know, when he came to his earthly ministry, the Spirit also is working in God's purpose, according to his plan, doing what the Spirit does, according to God's purpose. If God changes what he's doing, the Spirit changes what he's doing. Okay? And so, with that in mind, you look at what the Spirit is doing in Pentecost, and compare that to what the Spirit's doing in you today. And it shouldn't take too long for you to think and see that there's a difference. And what's happening there? Okay. The Spirit that revealed... Look at Ephesians 3 in verse, uh, in verse 5. Let's back up a little bit here. Where he says that the, the mystery was made as it is now revealed unto us holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that revealed the mystery. You understand? God knew the mystery. In 2 Timothy 1, 9, it says it was, it was hidden in God through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ knew the mystery because Jesus is God. He knows it. The Holy Spirit knew it. When the Holy Spirit was on David in Psalm 51, he knew the mystery of Christ, but he didn't tell David. When the Spirit came down and floated on Jesus, he knew the, the mystery of Christ. So did Jesus, right? But they weren't preaching it. When the Holy Spirit came down from heaven at Pentecost and filled Peter to speak, Peter was speaking the words the Holy Ghost told him to speak, and not one word out of his mouth was the mystery of Christ. So, so where are you going with this? Is the, does the Holy Spirit not know the mystery? Well, this is ridiculous. Of course he does. He's God. It wasn't the right time. Paul says in due time it was made manifest. It was made manifest by the Spirit. Okay. Look, look at uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 12. We've got to look at this real quick. In Acts 2.38, <clears throat> Peter preaches, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter preaches at Pentecost that the gift that you get is the Holy Ghost. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Paul says in Ephesians 3 that the gift he's been given is the grace of God. A different gift, Right? It's the Holy Spirit in you when you believe the gospel. The Holy Spirit puts you into the body of Christ. The gift you have is all the riches you have being in the body of Christ. The gift at Pentecost was the Holy Ghost giving them power. That was the gift. That's a different gift than what you have. God gives lots of gifts and every good gift from above, but that's a different gift. <laughs> okay? And you say what's going on there is the same that happens to you. You will diminish what God's given to you. Inevitably. Because no one in Acts 2 understood that sort of thing, and that wasn't what God was doing. But Acts chapter 8, there's a real problem here. I have on the bottom of your outline three uh, links from our website, which um, if you'd like to read, you can for more on information that we're talking about tonight's lesson. But in Acts 8, verse 12, <clears throat> we have a real problem here for those who think that where the Holy Spirit is, there's the body of Christ. They say, well, the body of Christ began in Acts 2, before Paul, so Paul wasn't exclusively given the mystery. In Acts 8, verse 12, 12, we have an issue because here in Acts 8, <sighs> Jerusalem has rejected the Holy Spirit. Okay? Stephen, filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts 7, is in Jerusalem preaching to the priests and the rulers who stone him to death after a very clear, lengthy dispensational chart lesson, essentially. He tells them Israel's history and what God's doing and how Christ, Jesus is the Christ, and they, they stone him to death. Okay? In Acts chapter 8, what you see after Stephen's stoning is the Holy Spirit leaves Jerusalem. Okay? 
The Holy Spirit takes Philip out of Jerusalem, just poof, miraculously. And the Holy Spirit is given to people who are Samaritans outside of Jerusalem. Just like in the Old Testament, when Israel and Jerusalem rejected God, the Holy Spirit, God left the temple and then left the city and then left the country. Same way here. The Holy Spirit left Jerusalem, and you see in Acts 8, it leaving, and that's why it goes to Samarita, Samaria. It's not because Jerusalem now is you know, a revival center, and now it's just overflowing. That's not the case. The disciples are scattered in Acts 8, verse 1. And they're scattered, and they go to Samaria, and Philip's in Samaria, and in verse 5 it says, He preaches Christ unto them, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. Now that's different, because in Jerusalem they didn't give heed at all. They tried to throw him in prison. So you have here Samaritans who are hearing things that people in Jerusalem did not. That should remind you of Jesus, right? Who's my neighbor? Well, those guys. <laughs> right, those good Samaritans out there. Those people who were not given the privileges you have because salvation was of the Jews. But anyway, um, in verse 7, or rather, let's, let's look at verse 9. There was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. To him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries, but when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, that's what Philip was preaching, the kingdom, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. People heard Philip's preaching of Christ in the kingdom of God, believed Philip, were water baptized of Philip. And then, <clears throat> it says in verse 14, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, <clears throat> heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What do you do with this? <clears throat> the question, the problem is, are these people in the body of Christ or not? If the body of Christ exists where the Holy Spirit is, uh, which is the assumption that people make. It's not a right assumption. That's what the assumption they make. At Pentecost, the Holy Ghost comes down. That's the body of Christ. Puts them in the body of Christ. Then these people who believed Jesus Christ and were water baptized, you'd have to say, are not in the body of Christ. But do you see the problem with that? If they're not in the body of Christ, until Peter and John come and touch them and the Holy Ghost gets anointed to them, that's when they get the body of Christ, then apparently you can believe a gospel and not be in the body of Christ. And that's a big problem. Right? Are you with me? Ephesians 1.13 says, When you hear the gospel of your salvation, you trust it, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, and you're baptized in the body of Christ. These people didn't happen that way. So I'm challenging here the assumption that wherever the Spirit is, there is the body. That's not true. Okay? I'm not even saying that they were in the body after the Holy Ghost came. I'm saying just because you see the Spirit doesn't mean you see the body of Christ. You've got to dig a little deeper. What is the body of Christ? What's the message they believed? What is it that God is doing in Acts 8, in Acts 9, and Acts 10? Not simply do they believe Jesus, right? Not simply do they have the Spirit, because the same Spirit has different ministries. Understand? And so there's a problem there, and you can read more about that on the website. The third thing in Ephesians 3, 6, that is the mystery. You have your fellow heirs with Christ, you're the same body of Christ, and you're partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel. Which gospel is that? The gospel of Christ. The gospel of the grace of God. Okay? That stands in, 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 a, in a huge distinction from other gospels in the scripture. All right? Uh, the twelve apostles preached gospels. They preached the gospel of the kingdom. You saw that in Acts 8. You see it in Mark 1, 14, where Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Peter preaches the gospel of the kingdom. Peter preaches the gospel of the circumcision in Galatians 2, verse 7 through 9. All right? In the book of Hebrews and in Matthew 26, you see this teaching of the new covenant. Right? There's the old and there's the new. Peter in 1 Peter 1 talks about this new covenant. Right? So what, are, what is the kingdom? What is the circumcision? And what is the new covenant? Why was Israel promised a kingdom? Where? It was in a covenant given to David. It was in a covenant given to Moses and given to Abraham. What about a circumcision? That was a covenant too. Right? So the gospel of the circumcision, making Israel uh, God's channel of blessing to the world, that was a covenant given to Abraham. And the new covenant is obviously a covenant that replaces the old covenant. These are all the gospels of covenants. The preaching is of covenant promises. The twelve apostles were preaching the gospel of covenants. You say, what do you say that? That's kind of a weird thing to say. Well, Because it's different than preaching the gospel of the cross. Different. 
You can preach the gospel of God's promises and God's covenants and not mention the cross at all. In fact, you don't need the cross for that necessarily, to preach it. I mean, we know, of course, God's purpose is the cross of Christ, but that's the mystery. Paul preaches the, the gospel preaching of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the grace of God, and grace is contrary to what John Calvin would have, 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 you, have you think. It's not a covenant. There's no such thing as a covenant of grace. No such thing. Okay? It's not in the scripture. It's invented. Meanwhile, um, <clears throat> read in Ephesians 2, verse 13. We'll see it again here. Look, look for this word by in Ephesians 2, 13, 14, or 16, and 18. One of the commentaries says, <clears throat> Now Bollinger and the hyperdispensationalists are in trouble in this chapter. What follows would indicate that the church was finished before Pentecost. Why was it finished before Pentecost? Because the middle wall was broken down at the cross. The one new man was made at the cross. The Ephesian converts included the prophets and apostles. Prophets and apostles. And it was at Calvary, he says, that it opened up the way for Jew and Gentile to be a part of a spiritual building and a living organism. At the cross, all these things happen. When Christ died on the cross, that's when he abolished the law. At the cross, he abolished the law. We have a hymn in our hymn book, not ours, theirs, called At the Cross, right? Come to the cross. This is what they miss. They don't read carefully the scripture. It doesn't say at the cross. Ephesians 2 verse 13 says, Now in Christ Jesus, but now in Christ Jesus, so when's the now? You've got to ask that question. But in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now the blood of Christ was shed at the cross. But it says by the blood, not at where the blood was shed. You say, this seems like semantics. It's not. Look at verse 16. He might reconcile both God and one body by the cross, which is the name of our hymn. We changed the word at to by, not at. At the cross, nobody knew this. You say, yeah, but he, that's what he was doing at the cross. Where do you find that? It says here by, not at. In verse 18, for through him we both have access by one spirit under the Father. You say, yeah, at Pentecost the spirit came down. Who cares? It says by the Spirit. It, so by, that word by, as we covered before, has to do with a means. It's, uh, it's a channel. You know, I, I went to Kokomo by car. <laughs> it's how I got there, right? Let me, let me give you another example to maybe illustrate the purpose between by and at. You have people suffering down in Hurricane Harvey and Irma and, and what's the newest one now, Maria, right? And let's say we took up a collection tonight. So we need to help these people out. We have a compassionate heart. We're Christians after all. We're not like ISIS who wants to kill these people. Who are hurting from Hurricane Harvey? You hear that? Hear this? They want to hurt people while they're down. Yeah. Like, this is the difference between them and Christianity by grace. Anyway, another topic. Let's say we want to help the people down there. Let's take a collection up to send the money, and they get the money, get the nice card we send, and say, "Here, we hope it can help buy some new mattresses or whatever." And they can say, "We've been helped by Swayze, right? Praise God, we've been helped by Swayze. Swayze's given us some funds to help us. We've been helped by Swayze. Now, if they said we've been helped at Swayze." be totally different, wouldn't it? Because they weren't helped at Swayze, which is where we're at here. We sent it to them, and they were helped there by what we did here, which didn't really help them until it got there, <laughs> right? By and at are different, okay? Yes, Christ died at Calvary before Paul was saved, before Pentecost happened, but nobody knew, and there's no evidence that God changed anything he was doing at the cross, it was by the cross that God said, because of what he did by the cross, I can now, later when he revealed it, I can now offer this, right? By that. You don't get a job at your graduation ceremony, but by your graduation ceremony, you can get a job, right? By the degree, by what happened there, you go to your employer and you say, here's my resume, and by what happened there, you can get a job. But you don't get a job at your graduation, That'd be some school, wouldn't it? Here's your degree and a job. You know? <laughs> he said he did. <laughs> some colleges, I guess, right? There's actually by and at, is what I'm saying. By is the means. At is the time. Okay? And what did Paul say about time? In other ages was not known. Okay? As it is now revealed. The, the relish of the mystery has to do with a purpose. A purpose that is revealed. Before the purpose can be unveiled, before the purpose can be put into play, the mechanism that gets it ready has to be performed, which is the cross. Before the purpose can say, okay, here's the game plan. 
you got to get the team together, you got to get the field laid out, and you got to get the goal posts and the lines painted before you can say, here's the plan. And that's what Christ did. That's what God did. He revealed prophecy, he set up this program, he set up the law, he set up Christ, Christ came, he died on the cross, rose from the dead, sent the Spirit, and then he said, all right, the field's ready. By what I've done, I'm revealing the plan that I've had from before the world began. Okay? That's what the mystery of Christ is. It's God's hidden purpose, his hidden wisdom. It wasn't known when those things were happening, but it's by the cross that these things happen. Okay? By the cross, not the cross are different. Look at Hebrews 4. Let's cover some verses here and we'll stop tonight. Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> the twelve apostles preached the gospel of covenants. The gospel of the kingdom, gospel of circumcision, gospel of the new covenant. And you see the difference in their preaching compared to the gospel preaching of God's grace and the cross. In Hebrews 4, for example. Hebrews is a book written to Hebrews. Okay? Hebrews explaining covenants. The old covenant, new covenant. Hebrews 4, verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. A promise given to these people, they could come short of the promise if they don't endure to the end. Ephesians 3, 6 says, The mystery that the Gentiles should be partakers of his promise in Christ. How? By the gospel of the grace of God. You don't get it by a spirit of fear. You don't get it through a covenant. You don't have to wait to the end. You get it by grace as a free gift now. You see, Hebrews 4 1 says, You should fear. <laughs> Let us therefore fear, lest you have a promise and it never be fulfilled because you, you stumbled at the finish line. You didn't make it to the end. Look at Hebrews 6 verse 12. You'll know them by their fruits, Jesus taught the Hebrews. And the Hebrews book says the same thing. Be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Faith and patience. What happens if they don't have faith and patience? They don't inherit the promise. The mysteries of the Gentiles should be partakers of God's promises of eternal life and salvation and much more that Israel didn't have by the gospel of the grace of God, not by the covenant. If it's by the covenant, then you've got to patiently wait and endure. Okay? Verse 15, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. You're partakers of the promise by the gospel. When you believe, Ephesians 1.13. What an amazing privilege. James 2.15. <clears throat> Look at James. Not what I want at all. Is it? Is James 3.15? Nope. Is it 2.5? Yep, that's the one. Thank you, sir. Hearken. James 2, 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to who? Them that love him. First of all, the kingdom was a covenant promise given to Israel. The earthly kingdom was. But even if you want to try to spiritualize the thing and say, well, this is the same kingdom Paul preaches, it's only given to those that love him. How do you get into the position in Christ? By the gospel of grace. That's the mystery. The Gentiles are partakers of his promises by the gospel. So it's not just that Gentiles get access. The Gentiles get access to something better. They get access to something better through something better. Okay, something far better you read about in Hebrews and James. Something more excellent, as Paul writes. Look at 2 Peter 3, verse 4. 2 Peter 3, 4. You see in verse 1 where Peter says, I write unto you to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers uh, fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. I don't think that's the verse either. Let me check, check it here. Peter 3, verse 4. Uh, is it 1 Peter 3, verse... 2 Peter 3, 14? Yeah, that may be it. We're going to move on there to 1 John 2, 25. 1 John 2, 25.
Oh, that's what I want to say. I'm sorry. Second Peter 3, verse 4, when it says, where's the promise of his coming? I was going to explain to you there that the promise that they get is different than the promise you have. You have your promise is in Christ. The promise that they get in 2 Peter 3, verse 4, is the promise of his coming. Remember before, they're waiting for the glory that shall come. Okay, in this verse here, the promise is of his coming. Uh, the promise you have is of a position in the body of Christ, of eternal life. Um, in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, then, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, that not willing that he should perish. Peter acknowledges in 2 Peter 3 that what Paul is given is for salvation of people now. Okay, what Peter was hoping for in a promise, his promise was of Christ's return. That's not the mystery. The mystery of Christ is not Christ's return to the earth to bring glory. That's all prophesied. But that's what Peter is hoping for. So when Peter talks about a promise, talks about a, a kingdom, he's talking about that glory there. In 1 John 2, verse 25, of course, John does write about uh, the promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. Okay, but it's in this 1 John 2 where he says that you know that you love him if you keep his commandments. In 1 John 2, verse 4 and 5. Whoso keeps his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him, if we love him, if we keep his commandments. It's a covenant relationship. Okay? In 1 John 2, verse 29, then, If you know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone which doeth righteousness is born of him. That is not the gospel of the grace of God. That is looking at what you do to determine who is of him. Okay? You are partakers of his promise, the promise there being, of all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, of eternal salvation, the riches of glory, in Christ, by the gospel of the grace of God. Not by the doing of righteousness, not by waiting for his Christ's return, not for the covenant and the kingdom. Right, that's, that's the conclusion there. Any questions, any comments? We'll cover two verses tonight. All right. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for making known the revelation of the mystery so that we can know your purpose. I pray, Lord, that this would not just be an academic exercise in studying some of this stuff and being able to handle the verses and, and communicate it to others, but that we would be able to uh, utilize the riches that you've given us and the blessings you've provided for us in our own lives, in our relationships to each other, in our ministry, so that we can truly live to be the ambassadors you made us to be in your body. Amen.